Hello! Today I'm taking a small detour from Final Fantasy and recent character discussions to take a look at the broader Tekken story from past until present to chart the character arcs and the unique events of the central story that really sets Tekken apart and lead us into the upcoming Tekken 8. Now, I've discussed Tekken a fair amount in the past, uh, but something I've noted recently is the number of people who are just now kind of getting into the series or, or taking an interest in the series and coming into a game that has had a single continuity and chronological arc dating back to 1994 and in light of the pivotal ending of Tekken 7, which was quite momentous, which will lead us into Tekken 8. It seems like as good a time as any to sort of give a brief overview and a recap on the central characters and events that kind of outline the series and, and outline why the new game uh, is so important. So jumping right in, uh, Tekken 1 debuted back in 1994 and for a number of reasons it was considered significant. Uh, firstly, the graphics, the music and the innovative limb-based gameplay mechanics boasted the technology uh, of the PlayStation 1 but more so than that, it featured a story that was quite a departure from the fighting games we'd seen up to this point. And while at the time fighting games had quite limited scope to tell story, because we only really had the introduction, uh, cutscenes um, and ending movies alongside literature such as game booklets to really explain the story, Tekken was innovative in that the premise of the game story was based around a family blood feud rather than anything noble or clear-cut and good guys versus bad guys, which was the quite reductive and simple story arcs that we'd seen in fighting games and beat-em-ups and other such genres um, at this time. And indeed, where Street Fighter's hero Ryu and Virtual Fighter's hero Akira Yuki entered their respective tournaments as noble warriors in pursuit of self-mastery, Tekken's lead character, uh, Kazuya Mishima, enters the tournament intent on murdering his father, Heihachi Mishima, who is the head of the Mishima business empire and the man who funds these Tekken tournaments. So the reason, you know, this game tournament takes place. And the reason for Kazuya's pursuit of vengeance is that his father, Heihachi, threw him from a cliff when he was a child and usurped his place uh, as a son and heir to the business empire with an adopted son called Lee Chao-Lan, who serves as Kazuya's sub-boss in the first game. The reason for Heihachi throwing Kazuya from the clifftop has been subject to a somewhat controversial retcon uh, later in the series, uh, and I will touch on that. But suffice to say, uh, for now, initially Heihachi throws Kazuya from the cliff to test his resolve in a very Spartan way and try and forge a, a strong and worthy successor to the Mishima Zaibotsu, if indeed his son does survive the fall. And he uses the adopted son, Lee, as bait to further provoke Kazuya into earning his place uh, at the head of the family. For Kazuya's part, uh, as we learn when arriving at Tekken 2, while he was dying at the base of the cliff, he willingly sold his soul to the devil in order to survive and exact revenge upon his father. However, in later games, uh, subject to the retcon, what was introduced was this concept of the devil gene narrative, and this is the notion that Kazuya was in fact possessed of a genetic malfunction, I suppose, he inherited this evil demonic force uh, from his maternal side that he'd had since birth, which prompted Heihachi to throw him off a cliff uh, and try and, you know, eradicate this this malign demonic force. So selling his soul was later kind of written out of the series and replaced with this sort of genetic, genetic idea, uh, but we'll get to that in a bit. But that aside, uh, and looking at this narrative framework for the first Tekken game, this tale of bloody vengeance and paternal animosity, the game proved instantly darker in tone than its nearest competitors. And while characters like Street Fighter's Ryu, who I've mentioned, were grounded in this Japanese bush Bushido sensibility of, you know, becoming a master of one's art and self-mastery, Kazuya is rooted in an equally antiquated Japanese sensibility, which is kind of linked to Bushido, which is this idea of honour and shame, and at its most extreme, correcting grievances against the self uh, in an act of bloody vengeance. And we need look no further than samurai history books, stories of the Agago revenge, the Soga brothers' assassinations, and the Arco vendetta, which became the basis of the 47 Ronin story. So Japanese history is rife with these fami familial you know, family murders uh, between warrior clans, and Tekken really kind of tapped into that from the outset to ultimately give our hero 
Kazuya um, a characterization which isn't really that of a hero. You know, he's not a particularly good guy, even from the beginning. Uh, and even in Tekken 1, the game booklet describes him uh, as cold-blooded. And so, uniquely, the central story of Tekken opens around an anti-hero consumed by rage, and a villain in Heihachi who is consumed by a callous greed. And it, it's actually the secondary characters of Tekken and the, wind, the wider roster, who we're not really going to cover here, but we have characters like King, like Michelle, like Yoshimitsu, and so on, who feature recurrently in the games, and, and they're the kind of ostensibly good-natured or well-intentioned characters, rather than, you know, the main characters. So really quite an interesting framework uh, for the story. So, reaching the canonical conclusion of Tekken 1, uh, Kazuya defeats his father, uh, and in an act of symbolic revenge, throws him, likewise, uh, from, a, from a high cliff in his ending video. Arriving at 1995's Tekken 2 now, we see Kazuya and Heihachi having switched status and switched places in the game events. And following the defeat of his father, the game introduction opens, showing Kazuya as the head of the Mishima family, Zaibotsu. We also see Heihachi emerging uh, on top of the cliff, having clearly survived, which is interesting because this is the first of a number of examples of Heihachi's raw strength in the series, because unlike his son, he is not imbued with supernatural demonic powers. He's not imbued with these powers to help him survive, um, so it's just his, this is his raw human strength that manages to propel he Heihachi on. But beyond this, uh, Tekken 2 is significant, and indeed pivotal, to the mainline story since it is a game that hinges primarily around the fight for Kazuya's soul. And this is explored with the introduction of the supernatural angel character, uh, and also the devil character, who provide the final boss battle in this game, and I would argue have a twofold significance in, in the Tekken saga as a whole. Firstly, as I mentioned, they are metaphors for good and evil, and the arbiters of, of Kazuya's fate, which has huge implications uh, on his story arc, but secondly, aside from a secret palette swap for Devil Kazuya back in Tekken 1, they are the first real example of Tekken delving from known realities and the known world into the supernatural, and most subsequent Tekken games would follow suit in having some kind of supernatural or improbable deity as a final boss as the games go on. Beyond the introduction of Devil and Angel, and perhaps more significantly for the future of Tekken, we have the character of Jun Kazama in the character roster, and while players didn't know it at the time, and this is her only canonical appearance to date, she has huge implications for later Tekken games uh, and the Tekken story, echoing out across the series up until her return, or her presumed return, in the upcoming Tekken 8. And really, it is quite crazy to think that Jun Kazama's canonical absence from the story has been well over 25 years at this point, uh, despite her importance. But the upshot is, uh, Jun Kazama entered the tournament in Tekken 2 to apprehend Kazuya over illicit business activities. But being a spiritually attuned kind of individual, she became aware of the demonic forces that surrounded him, and sort of joined in the fight to save his soul. And many fans speculate that she is responsible for the appearance of this metaphorical angel character to counter the devil that Kazuya had sold his soul to. But her primary importance here, um, and her primary impact upon the Tekken saga, is in the next chapter of Tekken's story, and in the interval between Tekken 2 and Tekken 3. And this has been subject to uh, quite a lot of speculation, actually. Uh, and once more, we sort of hope that the upcoming Tekken 8 is going to fill in the blanks in, in quite a significant way. But Jun Kazama ends up having a son with Kazuya, um, and this is Jin Kazama, who would go on to become the protagonist of, of Tekken 3 and, and later games. And the closest explanation that we've seen of their relationship and the nature of Jun's relationship to Kazuya um, so far has been Tekken the motion picture, which shows her preventing him from killing Heihachi, recalling the purity of his mother's love. And it is going to be down to Tekken 8 to clarify and potentially retcon and, and sort that out. Now, the canonical ending of Tekken 2's primary story sees Heihachi defeating his son uh, and once again throwing him from a very high cliff, um, this time a volcano, um, and he throws him into an active volcano which has a degree of finality about it and leaves us to perceive Kazuya Mishima as dead and also laid the foundations for the equally momentous Tekken 3 uh, and the debut of Jin Kazama. Now, 
1998's Tekken 3 is a widely celebrated video game, uh, and it's hailed among the best, if not the best, Tekken game, and indeed one of the best fighting games ever made. It pushed the envelope in terms of graphics, music, gameplay mechanics to new heights, it had great unlockables, uh, mini-games such as Tekken Force Mode, Tekken Ball Mode, and it was just an all-round really good experience. It was a fantastic game. However, it is also renowned for the pivot in the story and the updated character roster, which made Tekken 3 really quite significant and surprising to fans at the time. And unlike the small gap chronologically between Tekken 1 and Tekken 2, Tekken 3 takes place about 20 years after the last tournament. And rather than having Kazuya Mishima uh, as a character, who, who's now presumed dead, he doesn't feature in the game at all, or Heihachi Mishima uh, as a main character, who has once again been relegated to sort of an endgame boss, one of the last people we face in battle, Tekken 3 introduced a new generation of fighters led by Kazuya and Jun's son, um, Jin, taking the lead role. So the premise for Tekken 3, and the reason for the replacement of some legacy characters, is that much like the devil character who was introduced in Tekken 2, another supernatural entity uh, was introduced to this single game to serve as the final boss. And in this instance, it was the beast known as Ogre, who was excavated or otherwise encountered in Central America by Heihachi's newfound Tekken Force military group. And this Ogre is known as the God of Fighting, and it sought out and defeated several of the older legacy characters of Tekken, such as Beck Dusan, uh, Bruce Irvine, the First King, and June Kazama, incorporating their movesets into its playstyle, which was quite cool. But in terms of narrative, Ogre was basically responsible for these characters getting written out of the story, uh, at least for the time being. And this was great because it allowed the next generation of characters to be introduced. It gave them reason and legitimacy for being there. And also a lot of them were closely associated with the preceding characters, and thus usually had similar uh, or slightly embellished playstyles and movesets. So Hoarang and, and King II are, are prime examples of that, who entered the Tekken 3 tournament to seek out and avenge their masters. And for Jin Kazama's part, he was likewise uh, entering the tournament to seek and destroy the ogre that had defeated his mother. And the Netflix anime uh, Tekken Bloodline picks up on this part of the story, and it pretty much kicks off from the beginning of Tekken 3, adapting, abbreviating, and, and retconning some bits of it. But again, taking a step back, looking at Tekken 3, looking broadly at the series and what the story is doing at this time, we can see how different Tekken was from existing fighting games, and indeed general game series narratives, because unlike other series where you generally have a consistent hero or a consistent couple of lead characters, whether that's Ryu and Ken or whoever it might be, each of the first three Tekken games has a different lead character. And indeed, Kazuya goes from the hero and main character in the first game, to the final boss in the second game, to disappearing entirely uh, and being replaced by his son in the third game. So we have a much broader ensemble feel uh, to the Tekken series at this point, and it focuses much more on the plight of the family and this kind of blood feud, rather than any one single character, uh, which I really like. And actually, it could be argued that the games hinge around the actions of its central villain, uh, which is Heihachi, rather than the plight and the obstacles and overcoming those of any sort of heroic character. And indeed, as we'll see, uh, Heihachi was the only central character to appear in every single Tekken, up to and including Tekken 7. Now, Tekken 3's story was the last instalment to follow the original story of the external devil, um, or at least conflate it and overlap it with the upcoming Devil Gene story, which was introduced fully in Tekken 4. And as we see in the introduction cinematic, um, a translucent purple entity uh, that looks vaguely like Devil Kazuya from Tekken 2 attacks uh, and potentially attempts to possess or assimilate into Jin Kazama, which gives him that distinctive branding uh, and arm tattoo. The canonical ending also sees Heihachi, uh, being the villain that he is, murder Jin, uh, by shooting him, only to have Jin re-emerge uh, as, as a devil uh, and escape. And it was Tekken 4 that really shifted these events, uh, as I say, from external demons and possession to one of the hereditary genetic traits uh, passed down from Kazuya's mother into Jin himself. It's also worth noting, having mentioned uh, the Tekken Force uh, military group, paramilitary group, 
that from here on the Tekken saga expanded from a mere family feud uh, and a battle between these sort of core group of fighters to a story that sees military organisations, armies and PMCs battle for global domination. Um, and it goes a bit crazy, to be honest, uh, to that end. And we have the Mishimas sort of vying for control uh, of each of these various groups. So, shifting now into Tekken 4, uh, Jin Kazama remains a central character in the story, and now that the Devil Bloodline theme is, is canon, he's become quite a fatalistic, self-loathing character who wants to destroy the Devil Gene Bloodline, and also his evil grandfather, Heihachi, who has obviously tried to kill him. Tekken 4 also sees the reintroduction of Kazuya, um, and this was great because, again, it gave room, his absence gave room for Jin to be introduced in Tekken 3, but now, once again, the sort of cast re-emerge and, and conflate once more. And Kazuya has been resurrected by a rival company to the Mishima Zaibotsu called G Corporation, and as we will see in the events leading up into Tekken 6, Tekken 7, these companies, uh, G Corporation and the Mishima Zaibotsu, pretty much end up waging war against one another and it becomes this huge geopolitical carnage, as I say, with Kazuya, Jin, and Heihachi vying for control between them. Uh, the close of Tekken 4 sees Heihachi return as a final boss, and much like Tekken 1, this game didn't have any supernatural entity to battle, but the canonical ending does see both Kazuya and Jin meet one another finally, um, and sort of face off in their devil forms uh, momentarily. This ending further provoked uh, speculation around the fate of Jun Kazama, as she does appear to Jin in something of a metaphorical spirit form, and there's white feathers and halo lights and stuff like that. Uh, so it did fuel fan speculation at this stage as to whether or not she was in fact still alive, and that is something that still remains to be seen, and once again uh, we expect clarity with in Tekken 8. Now, shifting into Tekken 5 and Tekken 6, it's important to note here that while many consider them to be good games, and they are good fighting games, I mean they're great gameplay-wise, in terms of the story and the cohesion of the Tekken narrative that had been established so far, it is considered by some fans to have begun to unravel uh, around this time period, and it became quite unwieldy, there were a lot of characters being introduced, um, and they had moved away from this very ensemble, direct family feud between these three core characters and the occasional you know, supernatural element, and they had engulfed it and expanded it with these macro-political, you know, private military warring groups, and showing us characters that didn't have much bearing relevance or real progression to the core Mishima story, and that's probably in part why they really changed pace and narrowed the focus of Tekken 7 and honed it down to the origin story and the core arc of Heihachi and Kazuya's blood feud, and I think it very successfully concluded you know, that chapter of the game um, very concisely, and yeah, Tekken 7 they, they did handle the story quite well in that, um, bringing it back to the essence and the origins of, of how and why this series started. Uh, but I'll get to that in a moment, and, and looking at Tekken 5, one thing it did do that I found quite interesting, although people have mixed feelings about it, is they introduced Jinpachi Mishima uh, as the final boss. So this is Heihachi's father, who hasn't been seen or really mentioned to this point, uh, aside from, I think, in one of the game booklets. And this guy's introduced as the supernatural final boss of Tekken 5, as a, as a resurrected and demonically possessed final boss. And all things considered, it was interesting insofar as the cutscenes between Jinpachi and his descendants gave another dimension to their character. Um, in particular, characters like Kazuya, because it showed flashbacks of him and Jinpachi sort of playing and training when Kazuya was a little child, and it showed a, another dimension to him, you know, this degree of purity and innocence about him that we hadn't otherwise seen, and actually elicited quite a bit of sympathy for, for Kazuya, I think. And likewise, Jinpachi's interactions with his son, Heihachi, show how the latter was completely ruthless, and indeed overthrew his father as the head of the family business, and left him to die in an underground prison. So, it was interesting in embellishing these sort of different dimensions and different aspects of the characters that, that we had come to know so far. Moving on to Tekken 6, uh, this was quite divisive because it showed Jin finally assuming control of the Mishima Zaibotsu, having been victorious in Tekken 5, and despite being considered this tortured hero and main character to this point, he proceeds to wage war and cause chaos around the world with his 
newly attained Tekken Force military. And while it's argued that he did this for the greater good by some fans, it does fundamentally jar with the characterization and this status as a hero that he had built up so far. And it kind of removed itself from his core plight, which was to rid himself and rid the world of this demonic bloodline. To add to the chaos of Tekken 6's story, we not only have Kazuya and Heihachi still battling each other for control, with the former now controlling the G-Corporation army, but we have another Mishima sibling entering the fray in the form of Lars, who is a hitherto unseen son of Heihachi, and he's joined forces with the aforementioned adopted son, Lee, and his company, uh, Violet Systems, to stop Jin from destroying the world. And on top of all of that, we have perhaps the craziest supernatural villain uh, that we've seen to date, which is Azazel, which is a final boss that had te telekinetically um, been communicating with Jin uh, and those possessed of the devil gene. So if that sounds confusing and somewhat messy for a game story, and particularly a fighting game story that doesn't have much time or space to explore these narrative kind of segments. You'd be correct in thinking so. It, it is quite a it is quite a messy story. And I think despite Tekken 6 having some great gameplay, uh, and it was immensely popular online and, and stuff like that, I think some of those that were more invested in the story, and had been from the outset of the series, were somewhat deflated by the weirdness uh, of the events there. And so this brings us neatly and finally into the momentous Tekken 7. And as mentioned, this really sought to set the record straight, um, recap, retcon, and provide a solid foundation uh, and clarity to the Mishima story to really launch into the next chapter uh, of the Tekken games from. And so here we have an interesting narrative device introduced for a fighting game um, where we have a story mode. Uh, that sees various cutscenes of a journalist interviewing Heihachi Mishima about past events in his life and the devil gene and so on. And so we learn about the origins of the devil gene, which came from Kazuya's mother, uh, Kazumi Mishima, and she's introduced to this game for the first time, and we, we haven't seen her before. And it explores the origins of Heihachi's kind of love affair with her, how it ended in his betrayal, um, her murder, and the subsequent actions of him trying to dispose of their son Kazuya, because he discovers that she's possessed of this genetic devil trait. While this is going on, in the contemporary events of the game, we see Kazuya and Heihachi, and weirdly Akuma from Street Fighter, who appears as a cameo, but was also kind of slotted in to the Tekken canonical story here as well. And these guys are sort of facing one another down, and it really basically narrows down to a showdown, a final showdown between Kazuya and Heihachi inside a volcano. And here Heihachi is climactically defeated, and in fact killed by Kazuya, in what was a fantastic prolonged cutscene uh, to finish off Tekken 7. And honestly, if you are like me, um, and you have been a long time Tekken fan, and you've played the games from the beginning, it did kind of tug the heartstrings a little bit, because despite Heihachi being the villain, you know, the main bad guy, who's responsible for a lot of issues in the Tekken world. There was a range of emotions uh, kind of going through this cutscene and, and, you know, this back and forth in his relationship with Kazuya and his son. It did play out quite emotively in that final battle, uh, so it was a fantastic close that leaves the door open for Jin versus Kazuya in Tekken 8, which is what the trailers have alluded to thus far. With regards to Jin, he is somewhat relegated in significance in Tekken 7 to make way for the Kazuya Heihachi epilogue, but by the end, he is firmly established alongside Li Chao Lan and Lars as the heroic team that will seek out and, and defeat the evil of Kazuya in Tekken 8. And as we can see from the trailers, as I say, um, from this symbolic imagery of like a chain breaking to, to form the, the 8 in, in the Tekken 8 logo, it hints that this genetic curse and this link to the past that Jin suffers is finally going to be ended. And the re-emergence of Jun Kazama, or at least the spirit of Jun Kazama, as we see in the trailers, will likely play some some degree, um, some part in that. And indeed, the question of whether she's still alive, or these are simply flashbacks, the question of whether there is anything salvageable in Kazuya's soul, all of this remains to be seen, um, and a lot of us are quite excited for it. So, there we have it. Um, very brief top-level view uh, of, of, of the Tekken arc so far. 
um, somewhat abridged, as I say, uh, but I did attempt to sort of cover the, the core Mishima arc that really contextualises and propels these games forward, and how and why the game story has evolved the way it has. And as I say, it's unique in being an ensemble cast of not quite heroic, and indeed outrightly morally dubious central characters and family members. But that's what makes it so appealing and, and different, I think, uh, from other other sorts of games in the fighting genre. If you got this far, uh, thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoyed it. And please consider sharing, subscribing, and drop your comments below, letting me know your thoughts on Tekken.